Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick. We're here to discuss the offense from the Ravens' week one win over the Texans. Uh, a bunch of injuries. I know one of the things this feels like to a lot of people is a loss, and we're going to have a little bit of discussion about that. Here to talk about it with me is Jordan Coe of the Situation Room. Jordan, how you doing? Good, Ken. Thanks for having me back on. Always a pleasure, my friend. One of my favorite people to talk football with. And uh, tell them about your show. Yeah, you guys can check us out. Uh, I'm, me and my co-host Gabe Ferguson are over at the Raven, Raven Situation Room. Um, you can find us on FilmStudyBaltimore.com. Um, we're both on Twitter. I'm at Raven Sit Room. He's at Gabe Fergie. And uh, we're doing a little different this year. We're going to do some hot takes and some immediate reactions to the game on Sunday night. We're going to try and get that out there so every, we can all we can all have those emotions about the game on Sunday. And then we're we're going to check ourselves. And when we record on uh, Tuesday or Wednesday uh, to release on Thursdays, we're going to. Um, talk a little bit about whether those takes were good or not. <laughs> and I think some of, them will, some of them will be super hot, but also kind of what we saw in the game, what were some of those big plays and, and what to expect in the upcoming week. Well, really appreciate having some Monday morning material on the site. Uh, not having a film study episode on Monday, or if I did, it would be a, uh, you know, a, a thought experiment or something not directly related to the game. Obviously, that's not what people want to tune into directly after a game they want to hear what's going on and uh my analysis just takes a little longer than that and so monday monday night i record the defense tuesday night we record the offense and uh really appreciate you guys filling in with a with a a, a nice show there for for the monday morning people who want to want to hear what's going on sooner just don't have that uh uh what's the word for it delayed gratification requirement <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully we'll be able to find some guests and some folks too. And uh, Gabe and I go watch. The, we're we're both on the West Coast, so we're out in LA. So we're going to go watch the games together. Maybe we'll get some hot takes from some. We we watch it a, a Ravens get together that happens in uh, Los Angeles. So maybe we can get some guests in there. Uh, get give some hot takes too. From time to time, we've seen. I know Jonathan and Ogden has showed up at a few of these games. So who knows? Maybe we can get catch one of those folk. Um, I know Eric Weddle's dad used to show up to some of those watch parties when he was around. So. Uh, Exciting things to come this season. Very cool. Uh, Jonathan, I, I thought he was living in uh, in Las Vegas. Did he move again to L.A.? No, he lives in Vegas, but he is in L.A. all the time. And Gabe and I actually yeah. ran into him the 4th of July weekend last year on Venice Beach, maybe like a mile from where I live. And it was like the highlight of our weekend. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, very cool. Uh, the Ravens and Texans, obviously a difficult day for the offense in terms of ball security primarily. And I think a lot of the problems will be fixed with that. We'll talk about that a little bit, but also obviously in terms of the injuries, maybe we start with the injuries just because people want to know how they're going to move forward from this set. And we got some answers to that today and yesterday, a little bit from Harbaugh at the podium, but uh, Dobbins, we'll start with him in terms of the injury. We get now a look at Gordon. Yeah, uh, you know, it, it's almost too bad that uh, it seemed like Keaton Mitchell probably didn't need an IR trip, that it was mm -hmm. it was done for roster-related reasons, and once you had Dobbins back, and obviously it looked like the Ravens had a lot of trust in Dobbins. We were, Gabe and I were watching the game this week the whole time. We were, we were, we were surprised at the number of continual reps that, that Dobbins was getting um, at all facets of the level of the offense, and so... I mean, it's a big loss. I don't trust Melvin Gordon. I would want him to be the emergency emergency back if that's something that the Ravens felt like they needed to do moving forward. And one, would want to see those reps really split between Edwards and Hill um, in the upcoming weeks. And, you know, maybe two to three, four touches for Gordon if they needed somebody to really – come in and relief, but uh, I did not see any, I didn't see any tackle breaking ability. I didn't see any wiggle. I didn't see any speed. It, it, it's, it's hard to look at Melvin Gordon and be excited about uh, what he might bring to the table. Yeah. I, I have a, another kind of surprising thing, but I want to ask you first, can you hear the thunder in the background here? It's incredibly loud. Oh okay. no, I can't hear it at all. That's good. I, that's the, that's the I, microphone. I live in LA now, so I don't even know what thunder is anymore. <laughs> 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 uh, all right. Well, it, you know, the other guy who hasn't been talked about this, he only played seven snaps on Sunday, but boy, would I like to see him incorporated in the offense in a bigger way, is Devin Duvernay. And, you know, obviously at wide receiver, Aguilar had outsnapped him by a fair amount. And obviously all of the big three outsnapped him by plenty, including Bateman, who I think had the fewest with 25 of those three. Uh, but Duvernay had seven snaps and giving all this gadgetry play to Flowers seems 
not only wasteful of Flowers' ability to redirect a safety, but also kind of dangerous in terms of the hits they're asking him to take early on, uh, particularly his last two wide receiver screens he took. Both times he got hit pretty hard, I thought, for minus three and minus six. The yardage didn't matter, but the but the hits mattered. And uh, I'm just, I'd am just i be much more in favor of them doing something that was actually a little bit um, – unusual and trying to figure out how to get Duvernay involved in the offense more, whether that means he's a back and then sometimes you split him wide and he's a back and sometimes he ends up in the backfield. I'd be very pro seeing Duvernay, Duvernay take some of those reps. I know that's something that's been talked about, um, but it's, you know, it's John Harbaugh <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and sometimes with the way he likes to run his running back room or what they expect from running backs. I mean, they are, they are extra finicky about who they let play some of those snaps. And Tyson Williams is a perfect example of a guy that seemed like was going to get snaps and just like couldn't do some of the things that they want from that position. And so are they really going to let somebody that's never played running back be the guy that gets an opportunity to do that? I, I just I, I, I wouldn't have any problem with it. I guess more from a prognostication standpoint, I don't see it happening. Okay. Last year, it was against the Cincinnati game early in the season. I forget exactly which week it was. Maybe week five. Does that sound right? Four or five? I think it might be week five. I think but, it was week five. Yeah. But anyway, they they, they did have um, Duvernay run all sorts of gadget plays and line up in the backfield in that game. Uh, the offense really rolled through him in that game. In a lot of ways, this is like a, a comeback story here. And there's some little thing going on in the back of my head here that says they kind of intentionally held Duvernay out of this first game to not lay all their cards on the table for an upcoming matchup with Cincinnati. Uh, just something about this tells me that Duvernay is going to be a much bigger part of the game plan this week. I do think that the Ravens held back on their game plan in the first half of this week. We saw, I heard that one. That yeah, one I heard. Yeah. <laughs> um, at, you know, that on one of the third down plays, it looked like vintage Ravens where they ran one guy deep and they ran, you know, what was the equivalent of four curl routes. And it was, there was actually one guy coming across on the slant underneath. Um, if they would have had more time, I think they would have converted, but it felt very, it felt very much like a classic way that the Ravens have historically approached uh, third downs, especially under Rome and even under Cameron, they love to run three or four of these curl routes right to the sticks and hope somebody gets mm -hmm. open. Um, and uh, as the game progressed, they really started to open it up. So I do think that there's something to the Ravens leaving some things a bit in the bag here um, as as it's going to happen and roll out for the rest of the season. And you've got, what, four, two games, three games, three of the next four games are divisional games. So yep. you don't want to put too much on tape in week one to, to be given away what that's going to look like by the time you get to week five. Yeah, they may even do be more specific with Cincinnati as well and and still try and maintain some things. The Steelers got got hammered pretty badly. The the Browns obviously did the hammering to the Bengals, but uh, I don't think you hold back in any of those games in terms of trying to win them. They're just all too important, particularly this game with the opportunity to really stick the Bengals in a big hole with a loss at home potentially being their second divisional loss, starting 0-2. The questions would start to mount about Burrow if he had another bad game. Uh, you know, it, already the questions are all out there about Josh Allen after the loss at, at the Meadowlands to what everybody thinks is a pretty good Jets team prior to the big injury, of course, but what everybody thinks is a pretty good Jets team. Yeah, you, you know, you got to take some of this stuff that you're seeing in week one with a grain of salt. I mean, we saw it. We've seen it. Josh Allen, Josh Allen had a really bad week one in what the second or third year of his career um and was just awful in the first week of the season and then fine moving forward i think i think a little bit of it could be attributed to that we'll see i don't think the giants are going to be as awful as they were against the cowboys all year long i don't think the cowboys are going to be as dominant as they were rushing the, they're going to be very good rushing the passer they're not going to have a pressure of what like 74 percent of the time or something in those situations like that some of this stuff again is just contrib attributed to week one and attributed to some of this stuff happening. And and that being said, the Bengals are a slow starter, and the Ravens have got to come out and knock them out. I mean, I mean, I think that if yeah. they can come out to a big lead in the first two quarters of that game, it, they're going to roll over. This will be the Waterloo for the Cincinnati Bengals. They know how important this game is, and that's one of the things that's really unfortunate about it, starting with two divisional games. They knew they had to win one minimum. 
their you know their better chance probably to win was in week two against the Ravens since they played the Browns on the road. Not because there's you know a difference in there is a difference in the quality of opponent I would hope, but uh, but uh, playing the the Ravens at home they think there is a pretty good chance. Uh, anyway, we'll see what happens at running back, but I think we probably will see some of Melvin Gordon this week. I do hope it is Hill and um, Edwards who dominate the carries. But I, the guy I really, you know, again, I'll just say I, I would really love to see DuVernay getting a bigger share of the gadget plays in this game, particularly after the success he had last year against them. And I know right before you talked a little bit about the injuries, you said it was kind of, you know, a, a difficult day overall. I, you know, it seemed like it, it was, but the Ravens were very close to dropping 35 on, on Houston. They were, they were not very far away from this being a particularly big game. It felt like they did kind of pull their foot off the gas at the end of this game um, as well and weren't as attacking. And, you know, I think that's something that the Ravens are going to have to figure out how they want to approach some of the end of these games. And if they're not going to be this running, grinding team that they used to be, do they need to spread it out and keep the offense running all game long? Because the way you're going to sustain drives is not through these kind of like slow, grinding, run, burn it out kind of games, but it's going to be picking up chunk plays of 15, 13, 15, 18 yards for first downs when teams are giving kind of those windows to the Ravens in an effort to keep Lamar in front of them. You, you're, I mean, obviously, if they see a lot of cover zero, they need to take advantage of beating cover zero with deep throws. So we'll start. We'll start with that. I, and I, there's a couple of ways I could do this. I, I'd like to table this kind of toward done and talk about the injuries and some other things, and we'll we'll get we'll get back to some of the scheme things. But the offense obviously needs to be more efficient in in multiple ways, and ball security will go a lot a lot a long way towards fixing multiple problems. But we'll talk about that in a few minutes, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing would be I, the other thing they stood out was just penalties. I, I, the, the Ravens destroyed their own chance on both sides of the ball consistently in this game with penalties. Yep. It, it started on the very first play of the game. I mean, the one of the long drives for the, the Texans was multiple was sustained, I think, on multiple third downs due to penalties. Um, there were third and mediums on, that were setbacks from offensive penalties regularly. It's just Th- that is was pretty untraditional for the Ravens, but I also think that the refs decided that they were going to be like, you know, they, they have these games where they want to throw a lot of flags and that's who the, like what they want to do. Uh, I think that ended up being, that ended up being what they wanted to do in this game. And that's the result that they got. Pretty common week one uh, theme is that we see point of emphasis in officiating from the off season kind of rear its ugly head and then an equilibrium starts to be reached where they where they get a few fewer calls as as time goes on but that definitely was was something that was going on I, I think you know some of the things that happened on the defensive line I'll just talk about that briefly were pretty darn unforgivable but maybe also one of the calls was was something that, again I just I hate roughing the passer calls they always seem to go against the Ravens because they're, they're near the top of the league in quarterback hits in most years but they get there, you know, P, uh, Jones, I'm sorry, uh, pushes the guy down t- to the ground. Was it a little egregious? Maybe. Was it flag worthy? No, it's warning worthy. Maybe it wasn't. It definitely was not flag worthy, in my opinion. Of course, you know, I'm, I'm seeing this through, through purple colored glasses, probably. But I would say on the on the on the same side, I think Matt uh three penalties inexcusable in terms of the defensive hold is just ridiculous. I mean, he knows better than that. And. I can I can accept that maybe once per season he's going to have his hand in the wrong place and that might result in a face mask. If it's any more than that, and this was twice in the same game, that's obviously not acceptable. So Matabike needs to worry, needs to figure out how what he's doing with his left hand because he doesn't seem to have uh, a good handle on that right now in terms of of uh, where he may be uh, fouling another player. There did seem like a lot of hands to the face, face mask, like like that. Mm-hmm. Seemed, like if there, if I had to pick something from watching uh, a lot of football this weekend, it was hands to the face and like face contact from hands was the thing that mm-hmm. the NFL decided that they wanted to enforce. Like we've seen it before, where like week one was like a crazy high offensive holding, you know, ratio. I didn't hands to the face felt like it was like the thing that they decided that they were going to make point of emphasis this year. So I, I, you know. I don't disagree with you. It's something that's got to get cleaned up. I do think that that's going to regress very quickly back to normal officiating here once we get to week two. Yeah, and I do think it'll be a coaching point with players like Matabike that that is very correctable what happened to him 
during this game. So hopefully it, it's we see some of the pressure Matabike delivered, which was which was good. Some of the holds that he generated were good. I don't know if that's going to hold up, but but anyways, nice to see him generate two holding calls. Uh, but then had three of his own. He really <laughs> ended up being one of the one of the real villains for the Ravens on this day. I don't know if you caught this on the broadcast, but I found this to be tremendously significant. Um, Jones and Matabike both got a chewing out from Harbaugh. Now, normally, if they both came to him and they were on the sidelines, they both walking off the field at the same time, he talked to them both on that and he let it pass, that'd be one thing. This was a case where they caught it on camera, Harbaugh's back is to the field, and he's yelling at both of those players. Now, first of all, Harbaugh almost never turns his back on the field. And that's, by the way, generally a mantra of head coaches around the league is, you know, one of the things you want to do is you want to be managing that game the entire time. Your offensive defensive coordinators, your position coaches, they're responsible for figuring out that kind of crap with these players, particularly problems with penalties and whatnot. Let's get it fixed. You can, and Carball can easily, without ever leaving his headset, communicate that to his uh, defensive line coach, to Weaver. Weaver is a, is a man's man, a head coach himself, and he's a guy who could directly – deliver that kind of a soliloquy to uh, the two of those guys. But anyway, I watched Harbaugh do it. And obviously he's trying to send a message. The other thing is that they're trying to be very attentive, both of them. And that's the right thing. Look the coach straight in the eye and let him know you're taking in everything he has to say, whether or not you're saying bullshit, bullshit internally to it uh, is another matter. But just off to the left of him, Broderick Washington, who hadn't fouled anybody in the game, is observing the conversation. He's kind of got this side eye thing going on where he's clearly watching the conversation but doesn't want to look straight into the sun. It's a look of incredible discomfort on on, on his face. <laughs> it's worth going back. You know, the, the, the games are out there now on YouTube. Or what time? Out Do you there. have a timestamp on that? Uh, no, but it's it's after the second penalty, at least, on Matabike. Okay, if that helps. So that, that that will help you narrow it down. And it might be coming back from commercials. So even then, it's a little unusual. Harbaugh would have his back turned to the field. The only other time I can remember a head coach really doing this is when the um, Ravens got up 14 to nothing in 2019 against the Patriots in that big showdown when the Patriots were 8-0. Belichick went over to his defensive line and screamed at them when they're sitting on the bench. You, know, you, you guys need to get in the ball game. Blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, you, you, just, you don't turn your back on the field like that. I, I know Brady's perfectly capable of running the offense, and he doesn't need to be involved in any of that. But that, you know, it just it looked really bad, like it was a like it was a moment of desperation. And honestly, with with Harbaugh, uh, it, it, the very clearly was trying to send a message. The situation was not nearly as desperate in terms of of what the game situation was, but in terms of what was going on the field, he obviously was very much unhappy about it. He, it's probably one of these things where he said something on the headset to people. Then it happened again, and he said, damn it, I'm not letting these guys get away with it. And, and, and he almost had to prove it to the other people in the headset that he, that he would do something about it if that happened. So anyway, uh, one of, it's just one of those moments that, that really strikes you when the, when the coach isn't, isn't looking at the field. Yeah, I'll have to go back and check that one out. But, I, I mean, all in all, I thought actually the defense minus the penalties actually played really well. I think without the penalties, borderline chance at a shutout when it came to this game, they let Stroud just take easy throws underneath all mm-hmm. game waited for him to make mistakes and if they hadn't bailed him out on i think four or five or six different occasions in terms of penalties on key downs um they absolutely they absolutely would have would have shut them down i th- there's other than the injuries not a whole lot not to like i i thought about what we saw from this defense right well i would completely agree and stroud when he was under pressure which was a lot 44 percent of the snaps 21 out of 48 he was under pressure um, the Texans had zero net yards on those 21 plays. They, they had five they, completions for 50 yards and then five sacks for 50 yards to offset that exactly. So kind of a cool thing. Let's get back to the offense, though. Let's talk Tyler Linderbaum, obviously going to be replaced by Sam Mustafer for some period of time. Mustafer played pretty well in the preseason. Where's your level of concern there? Hard to say. <laughs> I guess we'll see from Mustafer. You know, I, I think that that the, the way the Ravens have changed their running approach, Linderbaum's necessary uh, requirement level of what you would expect from him or what you might want from him might have decreased a bit, and you would want to see in a more almost pass protection ability, especially if the Ravens were, were or are going to switch to being a little bit more pass heavy and competitive games. So in that sense, you know, we'll see. I, Linderbaum's a really good player, so they're going to miss him. But it, it, it's kind of as simple as that, just whether or not Mustafer is going to be able to be that guy and, and how they adjust the scheme accordingly. 
Yeah, I'll be really interested to see how this works because Mustafer was one of the guys who really stepped forward during the preseason. I was actually surprised the Ravens were able to release him because I thought he was a year four player. That's how they had him listed on the roster. That's how it appears to be based on his practice squad uh, time in his first year as an undrafted free agent with Chicago. He hadn't played well at Chicago. The Ravens obviously saw something they thought they liked, and he really played well in the preseason, got a lot of snaps. And look like, hey, maybe they've made another move forward with an offensive lineman, developed another guy. They obviously had a deal with him in place. And I'm glad to see nobody else took him because, boy, we would really feel stupid right now had they caught him. And uh, he'd have gotten away to another team that had an injury, say, and uh, and he'd not been available. But uh, but thank goodness on that. Ronnie Stanley, obviously, the the, the biggest most serious case of them all. Now we did hear some good news that they don't think it's the ankle. They think it's the knee. I don't know when you ever are really happy that it's a knee injury and not an ankle. Usually you want the opposite. Um, but, uh, you know, week to week for Stanley, we know that can mean four weeks. It can mean a half season. It could mean even longer. Um, I, I can't even rule out the possibility that he's played his last snap as a Raven from this. Yeah, I mean, you're always holding your breath whenever you see anything related to uh, Ronnie Stanley and injuries. You hope that he comes back. You know, at the end of the day, I'd rather it happen now. He get healthy and be a guy that they're looking at having as an option later in the season. Um, and you just hope that it works out. I think, you know, Makari against the Bengals is not as terrible of a matchup probably overall you have a good sense with you know what hendrickson and hubbard what you're getting on the edge from those guys and, and what they think they're going to see from him so hopefully hopefully they'll be able to kind of use the, the knowing them as a divisional team as an advantage in that regard but uh just another year of not being able to expect or know what you're going to get from ronnie stanley until the game is <laughs> the game is the final whistle is blown I think we have to satisfy ourselves that that's going to be the way for the rest of his career, honestly, at this point. And um, I think the Ravens are going to be motivated in some ways to begin the search for the next left tackle, whether they do it by developmental means in the 2024 draft. And I don't think they can do it by getting a high round pick uh, or a high first round pick uh, next year. But I mean, they've got to look at, you know, that's probably a, place that they're going to need to spend some draft capital yeah they're definitely going to have to figure out some kind of additional depth to tackle i mean or or you think that you've seen something for filet but yeah they, they're tackle is an area where it feels like the ravens have gone a long time now where they consistently needed some help i mean i think the bigger question was whether or not the ravens were going to take an opportunity to maybe move moses over or let filet play left tackle and keep Makari as kind of the first backup but it sounds like Sounds like Makari's been designated as the guy and he's going to get a shot. And that's why they kept him around for. Yeah, I, I think I don't think there's been any question about that this summer. I mean, there wasn't any question last year about them moving Moses to left tackle. And based on what you saw with Moses against Will Anderson, we'll get to that a little bit later. I, I don't think it would be a smart move at this point to uh, move him over there. I think they want to keep him on the right side where some of his run blocking and mobility, which is surprising maybe to say about Moses, can can really help them more. Yeah, and also Will Anderson is a really good he football is, player. And he is it, one hell of a player. And D'Amico Ryans, and I know we're not talking about the scheme, D'Amico Ryans did a fantastic job of making sure that Anderson was in a position to win his battles and that they were one-on-one -on -one and that they were they 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 were really well defensively coached. Uh, Ryans, did, Ryans did a really, really nice job in this game, I thought, in terms of scheme. I agree. And this is a line that has significant continuity together. So it wasn't like the Ravens were playing against a Texans line or previous Bengals lines who were all banged up and the players had been reshuffled like a deck of cards or whatever. And you have to, you have to, you know, try and figure out who's blocking who when you don't really know what signals are. And uh, boy, this was a, a, a game where the Ravens really made the Texans line look pretty bad with all the changes they made. In fact, in some cases, right after the changes were made. But they, but it was also a game where I thought the Texans, as you said, I think they looked really good in their one-on-one -on -one matchups. I thought they really looked really good with their scheme blitzing when they tried cover zero. That worked. It was just a, it was a, a pretty bad um, matchup for the Ravens' offensive line, despite their own, you know, in, their own continuity. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. And he also just had those, th those guys were fired up and playing whistle to whistle with real intensity from every, every single position. Um, 
Ryan's is going to be a good coach and that, that he's going to turn that team around. I, I it would not surprise me. I, it's not, I don't think it's going to be this year, but it, it won't surprise me in a few years for that team to be much, yeah. much improved. Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't surprise you if Stroud becomes a really good quarterback from what we saw. I mean, that just the ball security that he showed in a game like this, uh, where, you know, life was not easy and he did, he did fumble in the pocket, but, uh, he was under tremendous pressure, didn't throw a pick the whole game, and, and it was mostly zone looks he was getting. So, you know, it's not like the Ravens' defensive backs didn't have their eyes on the ball. They did. There were some passes over the middle, and Stroud didn't, didn't have one where he really put the ball in uh, in harm's way. Yeah, for sure. All right, let's move on a little bit. Um, uh, the Ravens outsnapped 72 to 58. This is probably my biggest concern about this game. And, and I, I, to my way of thinking, I, I think the defense played plenty well, that the, the 72 is not on them. It's much more on the offense in terms of the offense not being efficient, staying on the field the way it needs to. Um, the ball security would fix a lot of that. But ball security is not also going to be perfect in any game. What I'd, what I'd hope for, instead of three turnovers, is it's one. Um, and and you know, that it would have been additional points. It would have been you know additional time off the clock, fewer plays for the, for the uh, defense to have to play. But I don't see this defense holding up if they're constantly being asked to take 72 snaps a game. And in particular, where that's going to show up is on the defensive line. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I don't think that we're going to continue to see it at kind of the same exceptional level overall. I think some of it was random. I thought so. I thought Justice Hill knocked the ball out of Lamar's hand. I, I There's no question mm-hmm. to me. Like, I've never seen Lamar set for a snap and drop the ball. We've seen him jab at some bad snaps with one hand to try and snatch it and not mm-hmm. cleanly catch it. But he had cleanly caught it with two hands, was turning the ball in a way that he could throw it, Justice Hill's shoulder was in his face, and then all of a sudden the ball was loose. Um, and Lamar, if he fumbled it, wouldn't have kicked it, I think. That's the other thing. If Lamar knew he was, was in the process of dropping the ball, his his awareness is also super sharp, and it almost seemed like a surprise to him that the ball wasn't in his hand. It wasn't two kicks by Hill. I kind of thought it was two kicks by oh, Hill. Oh, it was both by Hill? Okay, I thought That's what I Lamar. saw. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it could have been. And that's a, I mean, either way, it's a good point. I, I thought Lamar should have had the ball closer to his body as he was spinning it there. Uh, his focus was elsewhere, it looked like to me. I don't think, you know, running backs typically out of sidecar understand the dance steps to cross the quarterback um, at the snap. And that's why you rarely see the ball hit the, hit the uh, motion guy. And you rarely see this kind of thing happen where there's some kind of brushing. And I wasn't even 100% sure that he did brush the football, but let's say he did. I still say it's more likely that's a problem with Lamar than it's a problem with Hill. Maybe the contact happens once per game on average and the quarterback typically holds on to it. I I actually don't agree with that. I think that – so I like Justice Hill. I think he's got a lot of opportunity and potential. I think there's a reason why in the pass Raven system, we haven't seen him on the field. I think he's not great at the mesh point. I think he's not great on shotgun reads, kind of on kind of the, those off guard pools where he has to make decisions between the tackles. Um, and he's not kind of like working with cutbacks and working with space and in something more like a Kubiak Shanahan style offense. I think that when you get him in those situations, he's going to be a lot better. Um, but and this is one of those instances where uh, you wish that Mark Ingram was not as old as he was. He's he is still mm-hmm. remains. Th- and this is why I, I think that this is Justice Hill's issue is that there are guys like Mark Ingram who were significantly less talented from the top end speed and leg perspective. But the vision and the ability to manage the mesh point and to see the same things that Lamar was seeing in front of him and work on and use those things together made the offense much more effective. Justice Hill and J.K. Dobbins did not certainly did not bring that to the table in this game in any way whatsoever. Um, now, maybe that was scheme, and maybe there's le- a de-emphasis on that for this team overall. Um, and we did see Lamar under center a lot more than we have historically as well. Mm-hmm. Maybe we're going to start to see more of that in, in addition to that. Um, but I, I, it, I don't know that I, I – I, we did not see a great game from Justice Hill overall. He had the two touchdowns, but if you take that away, it was not a good game. I, I'm I'm in agreement with you on that, even though I think his offensive line let him down a little bit in this game too. But your your point is well taken in terms of the mesh point. And if you look at the Ravens' moves from a general manager perspective, they brought in a bunch of retread, 26, 28, uh, sorry, 26 would be would be young by the, by comparison, <laughs> 28 to 31 year old running backs um, who were done. 
and you know Latavius Murray and Devonta Freeman and and uh, all those guys. Freeman was probably the the, the best of them. Le'Veon Bell, um, bringing those guys back, and we the only point that would make sense is that they have mesh point problems on the team with players like Tyson Williams and with Hill um, in terms of, of getting them to, to handle that correctly. And Hill was really a third down back last year, a guy who was on the field uh, mostly for his pass blocking. Uh, and there's question about whether or not he's really on the efficient frontier of being a pass blocker and a pass catcher. But I think that's what the Ravens felt comfortable using him with last year, whereas they wanted Edwards and Dobbins on the field more for early rundowns that would involve the mesh point. And I don't think so they trust Gus Edwards at the mesh point either. either. They, they haven't ever. Um, <laughs> it does, I mean, they've used him in, you know, more clear running situations um, and been he's been effective. But I think that when they are, what for whatever reason, from a deception standpoint, that that's not something they key in on. And so it'll be very interesting to see whether or not Melvin Gordon does, like that would be the one reason he might steal away some snaps as a result of this. Like, I think that the Texans' defensive approach uh, was ready for it, like you were saying. I think they have some talent uh, in some of those upfront guys that helped as well. And so we'll see whether or not that that res- continues. But all that being said, you're looking at some pretty good defensive fronts here that are coming up that they're going to have to face. The Colts with DeForest Buckner and Jack Leonard. You've got um, the Browns right behind them yep. who just stuck it to the Bengals. And then you got the pit, the Steelers right behind that. Um, so you've got good defensive lines that are coming. You've got injuries that we've already talked about on the defensive line. Um, I'm curious to see if we're going to see a lot more of Lamar under center or some of these mesh read plays just kind of going away over the course of the next five weeks as, as a result of not having Dobbins. Yeah, they, they, it could do that. Now, one of, one of my issues is that when you take the mesh read away, you, you take some of the, you, unleverage a lot of the value you have from Lamar. So you, you turn this back into 11 on 10 football. Uh, and I'm just not as keen on that. Now Lamar can still scramble. So he's not a complete zero in terms of the, of the pass game. But if you take away um, all designed runs for Lamar or all option runs, forget designed runs, all option runs for Lamar, um, then you're, you're, you're deleveraging some of the value there uh, that, you, that you have with Lamar. I, I, you know, while I I understand why they might want to do less to keep him healthy, I also think it probably is making them less of a football team to do so. I, you know, and you and I have talked. You and I disagree. <laughs> We've disagreed about this for a few years. I still think that Lamar would be more na- dangerous on your bootleg play action pools, and Justice Hill would be a better fit in a stretch zone read off like like you're improved. You, you still have the advantage of Lamar on a naked boot being a massive threat to any any defense right and if you're putting justice hill in a better position which i think that he is he's more of a one cut zone read runner um you know i'm more than willing to put lamar under center and use that as the the, it's not an option run but i still think that it is the focus on lamar even in those circumstances is going to be high and and re-watching so and thank god for nfl.com you guys fixed all 22 so human beings that can actually watch it without absolutely going crazy on these like seven second clips so i was actually able to watch it you still see the strong safety and the nickel on both sides in this game on option plays or not peaking in the backfield the entirety of the time there was a big play to to uh flowers on the left side on kind of like that deep corner route where Lamar got the ball out and the Mm -hmm. broadcast talked about how quick he threw the ball the reason he was the, the reason that happened is because the, the nickel was cheating in because his eyes were on Lamar and he was watching Lamar and he was making sure that he wasn't going to let him run in front of him. Um, and I can't remember if there was an option run in front of him. Even if it did, it was going to be going to the other side of the field. Um, I think the teams are not going to stop spying on Lamar. And I think as soon as they do, you're going to see a 50 yard touchdown or a, a 50, 60, 70 yard run from Lamar almost immediately this is i mean honestly this is completely contrary to my observations about boot plays and lamar and i'll just i'll give my side of this for for a moment here and uh, i love talking football with you jordan i really do so don't don't take anything bad about this but um i think the 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 backside edge defender is so hyper focused on lamar and the ravens don't really have a way to take advantage of it when they want to run a boot you can run a zone the stretch zone opposite that edge defender, but that edge defender doesn't play a huge role in that play anyway. The problem is when it's when it's Lamar instead of Joe Flacco, edge defender is a guided missile. 
on Lamar, which means your typical three options don't uh, appear as they would to a Flacco who can legitimately generate time and space by booting out and the edge defender goes, hmm, but it can't be Flacco who's still got the ball. And, uh, and then the time that takes to develop allows options at level three and two to develop. Lamar very often has to make a choice between that level zero or level one guy, whatever you want to call him, that's roughly at the line of scrimmage uh, and a run by himself. That's what those boots end up being. And, and that's not what boots are designed for. Boots are designed for explosive mid-level passing plays and explosive deep nine routes down that sideline. I just, in terms of, of real boot value, you, you get more out of a non-mobile quarterback because that edge defender is just not keyed in on it the same way. Even with Stroud yesterday, you can. As a better, you demand perfection. And my bookie delivers. NFL, college football, and a brand new cash out system gives you options to bet and win all season long. If the first two legs of your parlay hit, cash out early and use those funds for another bet or let it all ride for a chance at an even bigger payday. Join the MyBookie family for an entire season filled with odds boosts, free bets, and super contests. This season, MyBookie has a no-strings-attached cash bonus that lets you deposit and withdraw quick. Use the promo code RAVENS on a deposit of $50 or more, and you can receive up to $200 in cash instantly to your MyBookie account. Bet your deposit amount once, and you're ready to cash it out at any time. Again, that's promo code RAVENS to claim your cash deposit bonus. You can bet anything, anytime, anywhere, only with MyBookie. Film studies brought to you by GoPuff. GoPuff is a delivery app that offers super fast delivery of anything you need. Their simple to use app lets you order your favorite brands and products right to your door in 30 minutes or less. No middleman, no crazy fees, and no waiting around. GoPuff has literally everything you could ever want. Get snacks, drinks, groceries, alcohol, home essentials, and more delivered with a click of a button. For a limited time only, GoPuff has given new customers $10 off their first 10 orders plus a free 14-day trial of their exclusive membership program by using the code WELCOME1010. GoPuff's membership program gets you access to unlimited free deliveries with no service fees, extremely low pricing on over 150 everyday essentials like eggs, milk, Ben & Jerry's, and more, and insane weekly deals on the most coveted and in-demand brands and products. So download the GoPuff app or visit GoPuff.com and use the code WELCOME1010 today look at this and are on Sunday. Sorry. Um, all, th- well, he ran three boots. He might've ran more, but they were, they were very boot heavy because they knew they had to get the ball out quick and do some things to artificially create time and space for Stroud. Um, urban OA OA on the three boots that I noted in my, in, in, in my notes, um, they, they were right on top of, of Stroud, all three of those plays. And, and there was nothing there for him. And not only were they on top of it, but the level zero, uh, option was covered on one of them. Specifically, it was Matabike's 11-yard sack. Owe made the coverage play while Matabike broke free to to uh, uh, to grab Stroud on a boot, which is very unusual, by the way, that that we would specifically develop in that way. Uh, I just I'm I'm a strong believer that the more mobile quarter your quarterback, the less valuable the boot play is to you. I, I think when you don't have quality 11 person or like 12 personnel with a willingness to put tight ends on both sides of it, I would agree with you, right? So like if you're if you're strong siding the tight end and you're not giving any help to the potential edge defender in front of Lamar, great. But if they're going to key a guy on the backside and essentially give up all their pass rush to the strong side and you give a tackle and a tight end who should be able to take any defensive end out of, out of the equation, right? And then if for whatever reason they beat him or if the tackle is able to get it on his own and that guy is able to release, there's probably not going to be help right underneath there. And if there is, there's going to be a massive hole behind that for Lamar to throw to a guy like Mark Andrews, who he loves to throw to in that eight to 14 yard range. I mean, schematically, I'd say that the Ravens have never attacked bootlegs in a way to make any sense with Lamar. So it's impossible to say that we've seen the Ravens effectively boot with Lamar because it's never been designed to. 
Okay, I mean, that's that's fair, and that's obviously a criticism of Roman, but what, Roman loved to have lots of tight ends on the field, and there were the options to, you know, block But he also backwards loved to let the it. backside guy come completely free at Lamar all the time and let Lamar make that guy win, so then it was 12 uh, or 11 on 9 football, um, in, you know, instead of 11 on 10. We can... We could. We're gonna have to. We're gonna have to parking lot this. But I will. I will say this is something we'll look at closely as the season goes on to see if uh, that Monken makes better use of the tight end. Monken obviously been a tight end guy at Georgia to take care of that edge defender. And usually it's it's either a motioning tight end coming to the boot side or a tight end who releases, but then he or, or pretends to release and then he comes back and he blocks the tight end, take him out of the play. They're not easy plays. And Will Anderson, if if he's on the boot side, would be a tough guy to to make that block on. So it's, it'd be a, uh, it's, it's, it's the Ravens. They, they could have the guys to do it. They, they, they may also find they come up short athletically to, uh, to, to have that matchup against a number of edge defenders in this league. Yeah. Well, I think it is worth keeping an eye on, on how they're going to adjust though to this running game and the running scheme and with injuries. And is it going to stay the same? And are, you know, we saw, I, I don't have a count on the number of kind of those option run plays, but they were certainly prevalent um, and very much still a part of the game plan in this game. Well, overall 32 run 26 pass, I think a good sign for playing a bad team and playing with the lead. Unfortunately, I can't really say they played well with the lead. Now we had a little bit of talk in our production meeting. You make the point that yeah, they came out in the second half and they had a couple of touchdown drives, which is good. One one was short, right? One long, one short. Uh, yeah, one long, one short. That's right. Yeah. So so first of all, good and and really good by the way that we're not talking about them failing to convert in the red zone because the, the Ravens did really well in the red zone yesterday. Five trips, twenty five points. So that's outstanding. If you get if you get five points, but in fact, it led the entire NFL yesterday. And if you compare it to last year, the Chiefs led the entire NFL at 4.2 yards, uh, sorry, 4.2 points per red zone trip. So exceptionally good that they that what they did in the red zone yesterday. That wasn't that wasn't the issue, um, but they did not play well with the lead after that second touchdown. So they had four more drives, and I, I had their total yards here, but it was very small. It was like 42 net yards in their last four drives. I have it on here. Where do I have here? Uh, the last 20 minutes, anyway, they had three total first downs and zero first downs rushing. Now, you know, they wanted to run the ball and, you know, they still had Patrick Ricard and out there on a lot more plays down the stretch. And they had Edwards in the game and they had their offensive line in the game for most of that. It wasn't, you know, until into the fourth quarter that both of their offensive linemen got hurt um, and they couldn't run the football effectively. They could not do it against this Texans team. Um, this is a team historically has been terrible against the run. Now, Will Anderson is a hell of a player, but it's not like there shouldn't have been any ability. They shouldn't have failed so regularly to get level two first contact opportunities for their running backs. Yeah, I, I would say at that point, Linderbaum was out. Stanley was out. Dobbins was out. Not, not. I mean, definitely not at the beginning of that. Uh, those guys were last. Stanley and Linderbaum lost it both in the fourth quarter, and actually most of. We're talking about all three drives in the fourth quarter, yeah. Yeah. So Linderbaum was hurt at the at where he was hurt first, I think, or was he hurt second? I'm going. I'm going back to the to the game book here. Okay. So Ronnie Stanley was injured with 12:29 left to go in the fourth quarter, and they that was on the fourth play of their drive. So the Ravens. So he, that, yeah. He went out on the third to last drive. Yeah. And then halfway through. And Linderbaum went out on the second to last drive and just missed the last two plays. Okay. So most of the most of the game, those guys were in. I mean, in plays. Stanley missed 12 plays and uh and Linderbaum missed five. So it, it, it they still they were a portion of that. And even if they weren't a portion of that, you're trying to run the ball. So how much is the difference between Stanley and, and McCary when it's running? hurting you or how much is the difference honestly between Mustafer and Linderbaum when it's running hurting you maybe a little more in that particular case well uh, but they passed I, I I guess I would just say that I, I mean I don't disagree with you but we certainly need to see more um I, I mean they went the, the reason they lost possession on the first punt was because they they got they got stuffed on first and ten and then they passed on second and ten and passed on third and ten so it's, it's it's very hard to to put that one on the running game, right? Then the drive before that was the fumble where you saw Hill or 
either Lamar lost it or the ball got knocked out of his hand. Um, and that was on a first and 10 play. So I, I just think I, I would call it a bit more incomplete as, as my evaluation of it than saying the Ravens lined up in power, tried to run the ball and were completely stuffed. That's, that is not what I feel like I saw. I, I, I can I can look at any one of those plays and give an excuse for it. On the other hand, a first down play, which gains no yardage, and then they pass twice kind of thing, is an, an example of the run game failing them. That's it, it put them in a position, a second and 10 position where they, they – they But, were, I mean, if you're going to put that on – I mean, if we're going to talk about a running game to close out the game, then you can't be afraid on second and 10 to run the ball. That's fair. To That's follow fair. up on it, right? Like if we're talking about if we're talking about a, a four minute offense to ice the game, then you need to be running and giving your guys a chance to run on back to back plays. Yeah. And and if um, you're the 2018 Ravens and you're closing out the season with Lamar in his rookie season, you go ahead and run it on third and ten. Yeah, but, you'll run it every time. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah. so I, I do think it was just a bit more incomplete. I did think that this team was rusty at to start the game. Um, the cohesion from just kind of like an offensive line and pass protection standpoint. I think anybody watching the game would agree that it wasn't quite there. Um, and so you, you blend all those things together. And that's why I'm, I'm willing to say that I'm not in the same way that I will, I'm not willing to throw Josh Allen or any of these other guys out that, you know, we thought had really bad week ones. I think that those things can turn around much more quick from week one to week two than if this was week seven and we see the same thing continuing to happen. Uh, I'm going to be pretty concerned. Right. Oh, that's fair enough. And uh, uh, let's move on. We'll talk about Lamar maybe in, in this game. Um, I did want to talk about the pressure they applied to Lamar before we talk about ball security, because some of this is to, to me is an interesting story from the game. The Texans rushed six plus on, on five occasions. Okay. Now some people would call those cover zero looks. It's not exactly that. They did some of that in terms of, of you know, bringing up extra players that were beyond what the what the Ravens could block on one side, including Jalen Petra was effective doing that uh, on one side. But their, their six-plus rushes were um, pressure and interception, ball out quick for a pass right for 10, quarterback hit incomplete and intentional grounding all on the same play, uh, a pressure with an incomplete, and a ball out quick for a pass left 19. They didn't handle it exceptionally well, certainly, but in any sense. The problem is there are three drive-ending plays in there, the incomplete, incomplete, and the, obviously the interception were drive-ending plays. And I, I do think I'm, a, I'm concerned about the blueprint that this might create for some other teams, and I'm especially concerned given what Miami showed that they could do a couple of years ago against – in that horrible, what was a Thursday or Monday night game? I don't remember even which night Thursday. of the week it was. Yeah, I think it was Thursday. That game was yeah. awful. Was terrible. 40 cover zero blitzes in that game. <sighs> and and I mean, Lamar and, and Roman, and obviously most of the blame went on Roman because you can't blame Lamar for anything. But most of the, you know, regardless of who was entirely at fault and how they were, you know, not adapting scheme-wise to it, um, they, they weren't able to read hot often enough to get that done properly. Well, and, and even in this game, they didn't read hot. Like absolutely, I, I, they, they just don't. And, and so, hopefully, I, I mean, this is and this was one of my hot takes on on our podcast in the Situation Room was that if the Ravens can't figure out these hot read, big time, big goals, like big third down situations or big play situations, and can't figure out the simulated blitzes where six or seven or more guys are floating around the line of scrimmage, and they can't figure out how to read hot out of those plays this is not a team that's going to go anywhere in the length of the playoffs because it's going to end big drives. It's going to end big moments. And like, that's, that's what you need from good. That's what good teams succeed in. I, I, I'm not, I don't dispute that by the way at all. I think quarterbacks who can read hot effectively are, are extremely valuable and they're, and they're worth, you know, considerably more than, than even more talented arm talent uh, that, that doesn't do it well. Obviously, you know, there's a lot of quarterbacks who just freeze up with, with, uh, this, I, it's something I tend to uh, associate with younger quarterbacks in particular, uh, not reading hot well, but in this case, I thought Lamar, uh, was pretty bad at it. And I, you can't throw in the towel on that. You either have to try and make it the coaching focus going forward, or you have to, you have to make it be something where you design a set of plays which either Lamar can check to when they get into this seventh guy at the line of scrimmage. That's one possibility. Or you just have, have you know, 25% of your third down plays are designed to beat cover zero just because you know you have to go to the line of scrimmage because you're occasionally going to need it like that. 
Both of those things. I, I would say even more than 25% of those situations, yeah. especially especially when teams are throwing that at them. I, you know, I, you don't have the down and distances here on on those plays. I don't know if you have them handy, but my guess is that they were, they were you know, I could think of a couple of them. One was third and nine, and one was, I, I think, third and 10. 36 um, for the interception. First and 15 on the PR 10. Uh, third and 10 on the incomplete that was a dry vendor. Third and nine on the seven zero blitz where Petra came unblocked, and third and five on the pass left for nineteen. I think that might have been the one. I think that, that was might the, have been a throw to Beckham. Yeah, I think that was the yeah. throw to Beckham. Uh, or no, it was Fla- I think it was Flowers because the Beckham throw was deeper than that, wasn't it? It was. It was also later in the game. PL twenty nine, I think, on third and six was Beckham actually. Yeah. So, so um, this must have been to, to Flowers then for nineteen yards. Either way, on the so on the third and nine and third and ten, they're the two ones that I do remember. And the one where Petrie came free on the right side, and this was one of those instances. And, and I think I, I recall Miami essentially doing the same thing, which is they were mm-hmm. keeping the guys. Their defenders were like maybe six to eight yards off, so it wasn't a full press. Which yep. obviously, if they're in full press, you snap the ball, you chuck it up high, and you let your guy go try and run it down, right? Oh yeah, um, and, and you live you live with the consequences of that. There has to be some kind of interplay where Lamar and and those two receivers can make some kind of exchange to each other. He knows which one he's throwing it to. The other guy knows which way the other guy is going to block. And you try and use that one block to stave off where the other guy is coming from. And you just throw it out hot. Um, In that instance, neither one of those receivers on the, the Petrie play to the right, they were both running to the sticks. So basically, by the time Lamar got rid of the ball, neither one of them have, had even turned around and looked at Lamar. Mm-hmm. So to me, this is an easy coaching solution where there's either some kind of check or there's something to, to work that into the playbook, and it's just not there yet, but they've got to figure it out. It, it could be a receiver recognition thing, too. If the receiver sees Petrie coming up, it doesn't even have to be communicated from the quarterback. He just His, his, his route has to change to being a, a hot route. And you know, that's that's not a complex concept, by the way. I'm not coming up with something new. That's not NFL. You know, offensive coordinators have been aware of forever. So uh, anyway, well, and you can combo those things too, right? Because like the, some of the concern is like if the inside receiver is the one that stops and the safety doesn't blitz, then obviously he's right in that line of sight. And if the guy on the outside is running a nine, you basically eliminated both those routes. And that's why I say that's where it needs to be communicated between the two of them, right? So that they either, you know, they both know what it's going to be or the receiver comes inside underneath the outside receiver comes underneath the inside receiver burns past the safety. And then if they're as heavy as they are on that rush, it should be a three step and slant and go yeah. um, and a total clear out. You know, those are those are easy concepts to, to build in. They're just Lamar's at a complete disadvantage. And, you know, there's some ring of truth to you saying that Lamar, uh, us Lamar defenders say that he can do no wrong, but he's never been coached to do any of these things and it's never been part of the scheme. Um, and it's never been a regular part of what their approach has been in these situations. Um, and so at some point it's going to have to be, and, um, especially if teams continue to try and do what we saw in in these big situations, you know, you know, it's funny at camp just a few Saturdays ago now, and it's really not that long ago. It's less than a month. (laughs) Lamar had a Lamar and the rest of the quarterbacks had a nine interception day. And the excuse given was, it's third and long day. So obviously the huge disadvantage and the, you know, the, the defense just do with it. Well, it, it wasn't, that might explain one interception, <laughs> you know, but it just, the, the description of that entire day was, was funny. Ex- a lot of excuses are made for Lamar and I love the guy. I, you know, I, I, the Ravens so need him to be the guy for this franchise. Obviously the, the commitment has been made. Um, absolutely needs to improve in that regard in, in to, to be the kind of quarterback they hope that he can be. And I think ball security here is, is the, the name of the game. I, I mean, the interception was awful. That's inexcusable. Um, and it was, it was pressure driven, but at that point and they're in scoring rage, the Mars got to just eat that and not try and throw it to yep. Zay like not. And to what end, right? Like the throw, it wasn't going to be short a of the down. sticks. It was yeah, in the it dirt. Was, it, was, <laughs> it was just, it was just a bad decision. I think yeah. that that kind of thing can be cleaned up. That one was fundamentally on Lamar. The, it's interesting rewatching the All Twenty Two on the fumble where the ball got knocked out of his hands because I think what happened was so Gus Edwards started to come in to block the the one guy that ended up knocking the ball out of his hands, but didn't mm-hmm. get there fast enough. And I think Lamar thought Edwards was going to get there before him and was going to be able to go right. 
And then he realized, if, if you're watching the All-22, you can see him glance up to the left, and the safety that was closing in had a really bad angle. And I think that Lamar, for a split second, thought about trying to spin it on a dime and cut back inside and get inside that defender and cut up the middle between the hashes. And he got caught in no man's land. And he's like, oh, I'm not going to get this block from Edwards. Oh, maybe I'm going to try and cut it inside. And he's like, which hand do I need the ball in if I'm going to do whichever one of those things? And it, and and because you kind of saw it, like he, he's kind of holding both hands up. Like he wanted to switch, but he didn't know what he was doing. And then the ball just got knocked out of his hand. So obviously from a ball security standpoint, not acceptable. But I think that of all of the plays, that's the one where you just have to accept that that's going to happen maybe two or three times a season with Lamar with the way he runs and the way he uses leverage and the way the way he's going to put try and put guys on skates and he's always moving the ball around and he's and he's, do, he's usually smart about it uh i think this was just one of those instances where he, he couldn't decide what he wanted to do and, and it got burned it was fortunate in a sense that it didn't end up being a big expense well none of the turnovers in this game ended up being super expensive because all they did was kick field goals when they did score but uh, but they they lost some chances to put points on the board themselves and and that was unfortunate. I'll leave it at that on on your description of that. I thought, you know, they were very fortunate that Kevin Zeitler recovered the fumble on the double kick by Hill uh, or the kick by Jackson Hill, whichever it was <laughs> that uh, that that was pretty bad. I just I, all this is a case where it it wasn't just one of them. They were all kind of boneheaded plays. I don't blame, you know, I can't I can't look at any of them and say. There shouldn't have been a pretty good chance of him avoiding them. And if 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 you if if you call it and it's one, I'm fine with that. If it's one instead of three, but I'm but I'm not fine with it being three. I think it was it's well, it's three chances of turnovers, only two actual yeah, turnovers. Yeah, that's correct. The two actual turnovers. And, and you had it, and you have it backwards. The kick ball was the one that they didn't recover. Zeitler recovered the one when Lamar was out in the open field and running. I'm almost okay. sure of it. Um, I am not going to contradict you on that. Because that one was in the first half, yeah? No, the sack fumble minus five was on first and 10. Eight loses ball off 43, who kicked it twice. Team sack on fumble. So they did lose that. Yep, you're right. So, so and that one's more excusable, A, because it got kicked, and B, nobody expected it. I mean, the thing is, when everybody's chasing Lamar behind the play, you know, it, we, and I think we've seen this a lot. Either he's close to the sideline and those fumbles go out of bounds. And we, we've definitely mm-hmm. seen that happen more times than some of us want. Or the blockers are right behind him. And there's there you're you're um, in a much more 50-50 shot. Like once that ball got kicked twice on the Lamar, the, the yep. fumble exchange, whatever you want to call it, 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 it I, there, was, there was no chance. Because all the defenders are looking at the ball and everybody that's in the vicinity of the, the Ravens are all running in the other direction, right? Like right. they don't have, they don't even know that the ball's on the ground. Um so, I mean, yeah, it was unfortunate, but, you know, only two actual turnovers, a team that ended up, you know, despite giving up, a, having a, a snap disadvantage, still scoring 25 points, you know, realistically, without the first interception, it's 28 points, you know, with a little bit more continuity, this is this is a 30 plus point game. I think for week one of the season for having two turnovers and having a 25 point game against a defense that played pretty well, we both agree. Um I'm pretty happy with it. I don't love Lamar's overall performance, but I think it was, I think it was better than what it might have seemed like it was. And and certainly, I think it was certainly better than the QBR rating he got. Let me let me say there are elements of this that I think I was positive about. Uh, there were five ample time and space opportunities on the game. It was only 19. percent So the offensive line is not doing him any favors, giving him only 19 percent ATS. Those plays, he was four of five for 46 yards, 9.2 yards per play. Nothing wrong with that. It's not enormously great. It's a 60th percentile result probably for ATS, but the problem is the amount of ATS was really the problem. 11 times the ball was out quickly, and this is where I think we saw a lot of positive value from, say, Flowers and from some of the other Ravens receivers because it sure as hell wasn't the tight ends. Let's put it that way in this game. Um, 11 ball out quicks was 42% of the Ravens' pass plays. He was 11 for 11 on those plays for 108 yards. That's 9.9 yards per play. That's terrific. He should be somewhere between four and eight yards per play on those ball out quick uh, throws, probably closer to five or six would be normal. So 9.9, absolutely fantastic. There's a high point of Lamar's performance. The problem was pressure. So he's pressured 10 times. And first of all, your your offensive line is kind of betraying you to give up 38% pressure. And most of those pressures were actually converted because they were outstanding pressure opportunities. And you, you sacked five times 
uh, in the process. And one of those was his own fumble. So I don't want to get too much into that. But thir- of the 38 times, sorry, 38% he was pressured, 10 plays, he went two for six for minus four net yards with four sacks. That's about as bad as it gets. So minus 0.4 yards per play. Very rarely see a number less than zero. Even Joe Flacco would typically throw about, uh, averaged about four yards without ATS and even under pressure, probably about two and a half to three yards, I would say is normal. And, you know, I thought that the Texans coverage in the secondary was pretty stout this game too. You know, there weren't, there were definitely weren't guys that were running open. It seemed, it, it, you know, it was kind of hard to tell. It looked like they committed a lot to kind of man deep, but then kind of zone underneath to keep mm-hmm. Lamar in front of them. But that, that meant that there weren't receivers that were kind of running open into gaps down the field from what I was saying. So that makes it tough in those situations for Lamar as well, because he's looking for a quick, easy throw. And if he's just going to take a sack or eat it or try and create space and do his thing and not, not get that space. But I mean, we saw a lot of teams run into the this week where their offensive line didn't have it together. You could say it for Cincinnati, you could say it for, for new, new, the Giants um, and others. So pressure certainly betrayed them at times in the first half. There was a great, you know, they, they obviously made some kind of adjustment in the second half. Pat Ricard had a really good pickup on one of the blitzes. Um, you know, it was like a four or five man rush and, and somebody came free and Ricard picked it up. And then Lamar, I think, hit a big throw to Bateman behind it on that play. So, you know, there were there were some good things seen overall there, but the pressure, they've just got to figure out that pressure because if they can't figure that out again, and, and whether it's cover zero or whether it's not, if that pressure is going to be in Lamar's face, he's just it, it doesn't matter who the quarterback is. They're going to really struggle to succeed. Yeah, completely agree. Uh, talk real quickly about by numbers, 18 times the, the, the Texans brought four. They averaged 5.8 on those plays. Three times they, they brought five, 6.0 in those plays. They did bring six, four times, interception, 10 yards, incomplete, 19 yards. The 7.3 doesn't mean a lot when there's an interception in the group, uh, pretty clearly. And then the seven times, they seven, they brought one for, for an incomplete pass. So generally speaking, the more they brought, the better, even though the yardage might tell you differently in that case. Uh, so the Texans... I would agree with you. I don't think they're a bad defensive team. They certainly made progress on the interior that I'm not happy about against the Ravens, but players like Malik Collins and even Hinnish had a great uh, bull rush on um, uh, Zeitler for, for a sack. Uh, and, and obviously what Grenard and, and um, uh, Will, uh, Anderson. Will Anderson did uh, was terrific. So it's, it's not an untalented defensive front and and will anderson is a is a legitimate star player but uh but it's also a front that that the ravens should be fearful of yeah you know the other thing you know and, and this has less to do with pressure <laughs> it just popped into my head as you were saying it the one thing that i thought that i really liked was odell beckham drawing two of these pass interference flags yeah i mean i it feels like in the last two years the ravens have drawn two pass interference flags <laughs> Total. I think what it was like last year or the year before where it took them like seven or eight games to even draw their first defensive pass interference call. Um, It's a function of Lamar. It's it's when you, when you play against zone defense and everybody's looking at the quarterback the whole time, they're not as confused and grabby with the receivers. You, you want them to to be fearful of your receivers and Zay flowers will generate some this year. Some of the Ravens speeds that will, will, will generate Bateman will generate some, but in the case of the two Beckham, uh, DPIs. The first one, incredible veteran move to draw oh, the right. cutoff flag because that, he was nowhere close to that ball. He was not going to oh, catch right. it. If if there had been no one there, he probably you know he could, couldn't have even made a play on the ball. But uh, but the second one uh, was a, a legitimate you know force the defender to drive through him, get behind him, and and that's what I think they'll get more of from Flowers and Bateman this year as they start to uh, hopefully take on a much heavier snap load. Um, Bateman in particular than than they had in this game. But it was it was Beckham running those routes, obviously, you know, obviously Lamar trusting him in those situations to throw the ball. So so even though he doesn't get credit for those passing yards, I think that that's a development from Lamar's perspective. But then yes. I do also think think it speaks a little bit to kind of how the Texans the Texans were and maybe they were just playing more of a matchup zone on the backside. But it did look a little bit more like man to me overall um, than zone. All right. Outstanding. Let's see. I want to talk a, a little bit about some scheme elements here. I think we hit on a lot of this. The running back snap division, always something I like to touch on. Dobbins with 30, um, 
snaps. Hill 19, Edwards 15. Didn't see any pony. Didn't see any empty. Again, I think that might be something where we're just we're not, we're not seeing it, even though it might be in Monken's bag of tricks to show some of that. Uh, whether it's completely empty or pony, either one. Uh, but we only we only saw the the vanilla one back offense this time. Well, it certainly didn't need to see. Look, this was a, this is a nice progression from Greg Roman to Todd Munkin. Even if they really wanted to go into empty and and split out wide and do that, the the situation from the pass rush perspective and how the offensive line was playing didn't match that. And how many times over the last three years have we seen the Ravens' offensive line throwing a stinker? Um, and for three or four key snaps in the second half, you see the Ravens going to empty because in 2019, the Ravens were great out of empty. So obviously they're going to be great out of empty forever, right? This was <laughs> a clear recognition from Munkin that he needed help from a pass protection standpoint that they couldn't go to empty. Uh, there's def- We're definitely going to see the Ravens play empty this year for sure. Um, yeah. They have the talent. They're going to need to. I think it's. I think it is part of the game plan. So whether it was them holding back or whether it was recognition, I, I think it was the right thing. Give me your over under on non one back sets for the year. Okay, so so we know one probably is some high percentage of the total snaps, and we really don't know with Todd Monken just how creative he's going to be with this. We don't know if Keaton Mitchell is going to be on the back as a field as a pony or whatever else might be occurring. But give me your over under right now on what percentage of non one back sets we might see from from the Ravens in two thousand twenty three, like the combination of them or combination any any anything that is not one back what percentage i'm writing my number down right now um actually the percentage I, I, let me make sure that i understand the question here yes. are we talking about the percentage of plays so like one percent of their total plays are going to be non-back sets or how many non, different types of non sets compared to all the other back sets? meaning no i mean i mean you can have 21 personnel so you can you can have a, a fullback and a running back, but that's still a, it's a single tailback set is what I'm talking okay. about here. Um, but I'm talking about where where they would have either two tailbacks in a in a in a pony, or they would have zero tailbacks and they're looking to spread the field in in some way. But give me a percentage. I've got my percentage and, right. And now. the percentage of time that well, then like like all the, if the Ravens had a hundred more snaps on the year, we would see that three times it would be three percent that kind of thing. If if the Ravens had 100 snaps of the year and we saw three times, it would be three percent. Yes, but they'd have something like 1,100 snaps on the year. Right. So, mm-hmm. but but that's what we're looking. I, I think it's it's less than half a percent. Less than half a percent. Okay. Yeah. I, I now I would say it's more like four percent. And I expect to actually see a lot of creativity there. I think we'll see. We may see some of it late in games where they want to put five on the field. But I, I think they'll actually about one out of every 25 plays. So as they go through the season we might see a non-single back traditional set. And I think, you know, the guy I really want to see doing this, I mean, if it's not Duvernay, I want to see Keaton Mitchell out doing that. Um, split him wide the way that the... the okay, but, that got, but that's a... That, <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm saying still have still have Edwards in the backfield and, and have Keaton oh, Mitchell I line see. up okay. as a receiver okay. as the okay. pony. Okay. Yeah, got it. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, two to three times a game is pretty reasonable. I think I think we'll see it far less than that just because... Um, I've been conditioned by John Harbaugh to not expect extreme creativity. Okay. All right. Well, fair enough. We'll see how that is. And hopefully they'll have big leads and they won't need to pull this out of the thing. I'd like to see them get it on tape early in the season, though. So the offensive, the defensive coordinators around the league have to advance scout for that. Uh, a little bit more about this. They used 1.36 heavies per play. We're not going to talk about this all season, folks, like we did last year, because they were on a historic pace last year. And they used, on average, I think it was over 2.3 but it might have been 2.36 even um, heavies per play. So it basically dropped by about one tight end fullback slash OL6 per play in this game. We saw lots of receivers, lots of 11 personnel uh, in this game. Not entirely, but we saw a lot of that, some 12 still and some 21. Uh, Just a a very different offense in terms of that. Uh, Do you put any of the failure of the Ravens to run effectively? And there's no way to sugarcoat the Ravens run offense in this game on the fact that they just haven't figured it out yet with 11 personnel? No, I think I think it's tied to Lamar. As long as – at some point, the Ravens are going to have to either recognize the teams are committed to doing what they can to stop the Ravens from running the ball, and that 
to them, that in, very much includes Lamar, which is the player that they are the most afraid of running the ball. Whatever they think, whatever you think of Lamar and how he can pass and what teams can do, the one thing that they are afraid of is the seventy-yard run from Lamar for a touchdown, mm -hmm. which in any moment, if given enough space, Lamar, space Lamar can do right. So if you assume that a defense is using that kind of approach to prevent Lamar from running in all situations, and they do that on running and passing downs. That's going to make it much, much, much more difficult to run the ball at all. And so I, I felt like I saw in this game, again, the, the the strong safety and the nickel defender. So even when they were in light boxes where you'd have six guys in the box, the two guys on the outside that are playing in kind of like that curl, curl hook route area were cheating in. They were almost like run defender robbers where they were coming in <laughs> in that space or they would take a step or two back, but they but they weren't even looking at what was behind them in the corner, which is the Ravens started to attack that space in the second half. That's why they found success. And so those guys are constantly cheating in. And that is going to make it that's going to make it really hard to run the ball because the defense, the defenders are going to approach it from the same way inside because they know they have that help coming on, around from the outside. And unless you unless you are completely full bore committed to a scheme that is attacking those kind of concepts, running the ball, it's going to be a lot harder to run the ball. And so the Ravens are going to have to learn, I think sooner rather than later that if teams, they're going to have to do things early in the game to see if that's how teams are still approaching it. And they're going to have to flip the switch much faster than they did in this game to what they started to do in the second half. I, I I'm with you entirely, but I think basically this is you're, you're, you're giving me a yes answer to my original question was how much of this is due to the 11 personnel because Ricard gave them the point of attack physicality they needed. And Roman, in terms of scheme, was, you know, whatever you think of Roman, he's a magician in terms of, of getting run concepts that legitimately worked, despite the fact that other teams knew the run was coming. So it's and, a yes, but not because they haven't figured it out. It's a yes, <laughs> because in, until teams have changed their approach to how they defend the Ravens when they're in 11 personnel, which the Ravens are going to have to force those teams to do, they're going to struggle to run the ball, I think, no matter what. <laughs> So what we're saying is there's a set of reactions, but the def the defense has figured it out and the Ravens don't have, they didn't have any responsibility to react yet. <laughs> to, to well, that's right. <laughs> I know you're saying it joking. I know you're saying it jokingly, but yeah, that's kind of what I'm saying, which is that the Ravens are going to have to, they're going to just like they're going to have to counter these six, seven man front rush looks. They're going to have to figure out how they want to attack those. They're going to have to figure out how, if they can't run, if they can't live in a world where they can't run the ball with a Pat Ricard, what their trade-off is going to be. And I think that that trade-off, even in games where they're winning like this, is a 26 run to 32 pass ratio instead of the other way around. And and they're just going to they're gonna have to live with that or they're going to have to live with the, the results of the run game that they got in this game. Okay. All right. Well, Jordan, always a great conversation with you. We'll leave it at this for the first half. We'll come back and talk about the offensive line and talk about individual player performances in the second part of this show. But first of all, tell folks where they can find your work online. Yeah, you can find us on Twitter. At, I'm at Raven Sit Room. My uh, podcast co-host Gabe Fergie's at, or Gabe Ferguson is at Gabe Fergie. We'd love to see you guys there um, and to tune into a, a, a the Raven Situation Room. All right, other folks out there, uh, please, uh, if you want to be on a film study short, hit me up with a DM on Twitter. They're always open. I'm always interested in meeting new people who want to talk football online. Uh, had a great group of them come in this summer, including some people we're doing shows with, uh, Frazier Tafar, uh, who I'm doing the uh, matchup show with that comes out on Saturday and looks forward to Sunday's game. One item each on the offense and defense is a new uh, uh, person I've met. And I'm, I'm, I want to meet more of you. Uh, I, please uh, hit me up and I, I promise to respond quickly and we'll, we'll talk through your show idea. Jordan, thanks again for coming on. Thanks for having me, Ken. And we'll talk to you next time on film study.